The Gulf of Mexico is home to a wide variety of marine life. The Atlantic bluefin tuna spawns in these waters, sperm whales inhabit the area year-round, and whale sharks frequent the northern gulf often. Five of the world's sea turtle species are found in the Gulf of Mexico. All of these marine creatures depend on this ocean for survival. Yet there is another species that depends on something else, something buried deep beneath the sea. Four years ago, the Gulf of Mexico was immeasurably changed. Bands of oil sheen still drift along the sea and coastline. We have been continually altering the seascape in the Gulf for many years. Today, the Gulf of Mexico is a virtual city of oil and gas platforms. They stretch farther than the eye can see, eclipsing the horizon. Whether the Gulf will ever recover, still remains a mystery. How we got here is not. The flash of power, the gleam of oil. Well, you know what makes your auto run. For millions of years, this source of power slept peacefully in the dark recesses of the earth until modern magic Loose the liquid energy from its subterranean prison. Great areas became forests of... Second only to taxes, oil is the greatest revenue in the U.S. Treasury. In 1896, the first offshore drilling rigs were established on the continental shelf near the coast of Santa Barbara, California. In 1969, Santa Barbara experienced the worst environmental disaster of the time. Over 2.5 million gallons of crude oil gushed into the ocean after a blowout at an offshore drilling rig. Over a hundred miles of pristine California beach were littered with oily dead birds and marine animals. After Santa Barbara, the nation was divided into pro-offshore drilling and anti-offshore drilling. The debate became so contentious, it even became a campaign topic in the 1988 presidential election. Little did we know what was waiting for us just around the corner in March of 1989. The worst oil spill in this nation's history. It took place on Friday when a super tanker owned by the Exxon Corporation hit a reef 25 miles off the port of Valdez. By today, 10 million gallons of oil covered 100 square miles of ocean. We all know that human activities are changing. In the wake of the Exxon Valdez, President H.W. Bush reacted to the public outcry and banned offshore drilling. That ban was continued by his successor and lasted for over 15 years. It wasn't until 2007, in President George W. Bush's second term, that he lifted his father's 17-year ban on offshore drilling. We need to take action now to expand domestic oil production. So today I've issued a, more, a memorandum to lift the executive prohibition on oil exploration in the OCS. With this action, the executive branch's restrictions on this exploration have been cleared away. Oil means horsepower in a horsepower-using world. More power to you.
I'm Bonnie Shoemaker. I'm a PhD physicist from California Institute of Technology. I brought my little plane out here in April of 2010 after the BP spilled to see what I could do to help. The scientists that I would take out, they were absolutely changed once I took them out there in the plane and they saw with their own eyes that we were flying over miles and miles and miles of non-stop oil. That's when they realized that this is really bad. We've probably single-handedly done the most to force accountability on these guys. Because when I come back from every flight and I report, I put in 20 NRC reports, the Coast Guard has to answer. The oil the gas company has to answer. You know, so it's like, oh God, she flew again. You know, here we go. That was not pretty what I was showing. Even, even around the BP site, the Deepwater Horizon, there was extensive sheen, continued leakage into 2012. And I'm not sure that anyone else was monitoring that. That cost them a lot of money to go out there and fix that. If nobody bothered to notice it, they wouldn't have had to do anything. So I was not popular. Well, what's wrong with letting people know the truth? The people of BP made a commitment to the Gulf. And every day since, we've worked hard to keep it. BP has paid over $23 billion to help people and businesses who were affected. We're paying for all spill-related cleanup costs. Today, the beaches and Gulf are open for everyone to enjoy. And we're making sure people know that the Gulf is open for business. The beaches are beautiful, the seafood is delicious. Last year, many areas even reported record tourism seasons. I was born here. I'm still here, and so is BP. We're committed to the Gulf for everyone who loves it and everyone who calls it home. Unfortunately, things for the commercial fishermen in southeast Louisiana is not as good as those uh, BP commercials would have you believe. My shrimp production is down, still down, between 40 and 60 percent in my area. I've been making a living in Lake Bourne myself for 29 years, running a boat. I can't do it anymore. My oyster production is down at least 93 percent. In the last four years, I might have sold about 1,500 sacks. In four years, I used to sell that a week. That $240 million worth of BP commercials has a lot of people believing that we're okay. We're not. People are losing it because of they, they can't do what they want to do for a living. So you get a choice, well, let's go do something else. They give you an option. We'll retrain you. I say, what you going to retrain me to be, a brain surgeon? Now, or, or cable installer. Either one of them sucks. You know, I don't have the education to be a brain surgeon. I'm not going to install cable. If you take me and put me in the carpenter field or the welding, well, I'm putting somebody else out of a job. So here comes that domino effect we're telling you about. Oyster production is like the canary in the mine. Okay, the canary dies, you're in trouble, get out of there. Until we get our oyster population back, which filters the waters, we're not going to have a good environment. You know, commercial fishermen, you know, you have, you have highs and lows, economics, highs and lows with weather, hurricanes, you know. But this man-made disaster is just lingering. We're still in trouble. The spill has brought light uh, to a lot of the issues in the Gulf and all of the ancillary businesses, uh, family fisheries, docks, the marina, the ice houses, the transportation companies, people who provide snacks and groceries to stores. All of that is a direct reflection of what can happen when things cease. After the oil spill, you know, they shut recreational fishing, they shut commercial fishing, and, and, and that just, you know, that killed everybody in this part of, part of the world, really. It's affected everything, and it's affected every business around. It's how we count off the seasons, you know, it's oyster season or it's crab season, it's, you know, uh, crawfish season, you know, and even that, we're having some issues with, we've taken it for granted for so long that it's, it's a little disconcerting um, and it feels different how you approach things. It's affecting my, my life and my culture. This is not a normal situation. To see what it was like and to see what it is like today. My name's Al Sunseri. I'm co-owner and president of P&J Oyster Company. Been in business here for 138 years. With my brother, we've owned the business since the mid-1980s. This Shucking House 
has been in operation since 1921. You'll see today that there's no one in here. We'd have four people here, six on that side, and seven over here. We chuck 120 to 140 sacks of oysters a day. Now, it, you know, if we do a third of that, that's plenty. We're uh, having to get what we can, and uh, that is of higher quality, and it's limited. Uh, we're not going to just sell anything. We're not going to do it under our brand. We've been doing this for 138 years. To do something that's inferior wouldn't be the right thing to do uh, for our family's business. Well, I used to get very emotional talking about this, but have began to be able to compartmentalize the whole thing and not think about it, because the people that worked out here and processed our oysters, we all grew up with. This cooler used to always be filled up with product. I got a few shells, that's shells that we shuck over the last 10 days. Louisiana used to produce 40% of all the market uh, oysters from their public oyster grounds. Public grounds used to produce almost 100% of all the seed oysters. And since the oil disaster, those areas have been non-productive. More and more processors like ourselves have gone out of business. And as time goes on, there's gonna be less of us doing this because we can't hold out. We haven't received anything from BP. We've been able to go through all those years of operation. Our families have gone five generations now through all those different ups and downs, the wars, the natural disasters, and this man-made disaster is about the biggest hurdle we've ever had to overcome. Eleven men died that day, don't forget it. Every one of those men, they had families. They had wives and parents and children. And all those families have been deprived of their loved ones. Everybody thinks about the long-term pollution in the Gulf, and it's out there. But don't forget we're talking about human lives here. The industry over and over again has proven itself to be exceedingly irresponsible. Irresponsibility includes covering up how much they pollute. BP did not want any outside help. An expert outside help from around the world was offered and rejected. And the reason they turned them down is because they didn't want anybody to know exactly how much oil was being released from that explosion. The reason they didn't want anybody to know how much they were polluting is because the fine is based on the amount of pollution. I apologize. I do not want to live in a country where any time a citizen or a corporation does something that is legitimately wrong is subject to some sort of political pressure that is again in my words amounts to a shakedown. Local communities and those who joined the response team to help with the cleanup have not recovered. Their communities have not recovered. For them, life as they know it has changed indefinitely they may never get their lives back. Well, they was letting people swim in the water right in front of me, the dispersants. They were spraying all the animals were trying to get out the water. These animals was alive. Well, these suckers was crawling out the water. Crabs, mullet, flounders, shrimp, everything. 2010 in May, I went to work with BP and the tragic started in my life. So on the third week of the uh, program, I fell out. Pam, I had to go be rushed to the emergency room. I'm puking, throwing up, shitting on myself, bleeding out my ass. So he said, son, you've been chemically poisoned. He says, why ain't y'all got y'all's respirators on? 
and y'all's y'all suits and y'all's tape around y'all's boots and gloves and your eye contacts and your stuff. I said, they never, never give us any. He said, y'all shouldn't even be on this water, man. So I went back and told my supervisor. We pulled blood out of me, me and my wife. My wife's got secondhand exposure. So I went back and told my supervisor that what this doctor told me. He told me if I said anything else, I'd be terminated. In 2011, I was exposed to it. Well, by the fall of 2011, I was so sick. And it wasn't just this net, it was all the nets that I was coming across. It goes through these nets and, it's, and that dispersion sticks to everything it touches. It sticks to the needle I'm sewing on, it sticks to my hands. Like I said, it sticks to my shoes and I walk in the house and it's sticking to the floor. It followed me inside and exposed my family. 80, 90% of my business was repairs because Fishermen don't want new trawls every time you turn around. They rip a hole in one, they want somebody to fix it. My business has went down because I no longer handle any kind of used commercial gear coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. You want something new, I'll make you something new. Used, you have to find somebody that's willing to touch your net because I don't touch them anymore. I know it's toxic. There's two kinds of people, the ones that get sick and the ones that are going to get sick. There's so many different things wrong with me now that I never had problems with. I've lost faith in, in, in our system. Uh, I think our government has is, is prostituted itself. The people's health should have been first. People like myself, older people, uh, we should have been given some kind of uh, warning. They made victims of victims. I was recovering from Katrina. But I'm not going to recover from uh, BP. There's a, a human health crisis raging in the Gulf. I don't think a lot of people know that, but it's true. There are thousands of people who are very, very sick. There's something called Gulf Coast Syndrome that people have, and there's so many symptoms uh, that are included in that, but it's neurological symptoms like tremors, memory loss, uh, palsy. There are um, heart symptoms, liver damage, kidney damage. There's uh, skin damage, skin rashes. There's cancer now starting to emerge. Corexid um, causes the oil to enter the body uh, more readily. Corexid is the, the solvent that opens up the, the cell walls. It goes through lipid. That's why it breaks up the oil. Once it's in the body, oil targets every organ system. The liver, the kidney, the heart, the, the brain, everything. The mixture of Corexid and oil is highly toxic. We know this. There have been studies done from previous oil spills, particularly the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Corexit 9527 contains a very toxic solvent, butoxyethanol. It causes internal bleeding. The cleanup workers were suffering from internal bleeding, hemorrhaging. Why would BP choose to use this toxic dispersant? Well, first of all, they're allowed to use it uh, under our current regulations. Two million gallons of Corexit were released. We're not just talking about an oil spill, we're talking about a chemical experiment. It was highly experimental to use that volume of dispersant in this major oil spill. This is an industry that has a track record of running roughshod over local and state governments and regulators. The public uh, and most people just aren't aware how massive of, of an enterprise is going on uh, on the Louisiana coast. A lot of these pipelines weren't meant to be in water uh, and salt water is very corrosive. So there's, uh, there's a constant problem with, with leaking pipelines. Without those wetlands, um, you know, that, that's really what's necessary for protecting you know, our coastal communities from storm surge, from hurricanes. You know, it's not out of the, the stretch of imagination that we could have a multiple blowout situation in the Gulf. Um, combined with a Category 5 hurricane, you know, washing all that oil into the shore. That's what keeps me up at night. BP disaster was, was predictable. Poorly regulated industry, you know, maximizing profits, cutting corners, taking risks. 
Uh, in some senses, it just happened to be BP. But they're not some outlier in the industry. The lessons that should have been learned from the BP disaster have not been learned. There are risky practices that happen anytime you're drilling in deep water. In terms of uh, response preparedness, uh, we're woefully uh, unprepared. In fact, we would be in a similar situation um, that we were in 2010 when it comes to mobilizing response. Coast Guard says it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We would like to see them held fully accountable for causing the largest man-made environmental disaster in U.S. history. The exploration side of the industry is moving far too fast for the response side and it should be the other way around. There's also this absurd honor system by the industry to report their own violations. The leaks and spills that we're finding on a regular basis are quite often vastly underreported in terms of size and a lot of times they don't get reported at all. The oil and gas industry is pressuring the federal government to allow the first step in offshore drilling in the Atlantic as soon as possible. This first step, known as seismic air gun blasting, not only leads the way for risky drilling, but threatens the survival of marine species caught in the crossfire of these blasts. Seismic air guns, towed by ships in vast arrays, emit blasts of compressed air into the ocean, mapping the seafloor for deeply buried pockets of oil and gas. The blasts from these air guns are almost incomprehensibly loud, a hundred thousand times louder than a jet plane engine, and powerful enough to penetrate several miles deep into the seafloor. The dynamite-like blasts are repeated every ten seconds, 24 hours a day, for days to weeks to even months on end. Seismic blasts threaten not only the hearing of marine life, they threaten their very survival. More than half a million people in coastal communities on the east coast of the United States depend on a healthy, vibrant ocean for their livelihoods. Seismic air gun blasting will put the stability of the regional fisheries and those that depend on them in jeopardy. Our government is currently taking steps to open the Atlantic to offshore drilling. In every single ocean where we have drilled, time and time again, we have spilled. It is scary for me to hear that they want to put offshore oil platforms off the coast of the Atlantic. It'd be pretty irresponsible to think that, well, you know, we've learned our lessons, it'll be fine. If anybody um, would like to find out about the real cost for drilling offshore, they should come see us here in Louisiana. When you don't have a life on a reef, the reef is dead, the habitat's dead. I usually catch 10,000 pounds a week. We're down to 3,000 pounds a week. It's not going to be pretty. Uh, life as they know it will, will be changed. Mississippi has seen a 50% drop in the number of wetlands along our coast in a 100 year period. Anytime you're moving the kind of oil and gas we're moving in America, you're gonna have problems. Um, you're gonna have spills. At what point are we willing to say enough? Democracy is not a spectator sport. It sounds sort of rhetorical and cliched, but I've lived it. I've seen it happen. I've seen communities come together, build coalition, and I know that we can work together and we can break this cycle. On January 27th, 2014, Curie Beach, North Carolina did just that. This small community came together to oppose their mayor's support for seismic blasting off their coast. Citizen after citizen spoke up and shared their vision for the coast. I am only not, but I hope you will give me a chance and hear what I have to say. I hope that you will think again about seismic testing off our coast. I love the ocean. Some things just shouldn't be for sale. Could you please pretend like you're listening and be awesome? With the majority of the town that you represent oppose seismic testing. If anything, it's going to take jobs away. The cost of this community is simply too great to trade seismic testing for the false hope of future revenues. I really can't see how this is going to benefit us. I respect if you support offshore drilling and seismic testing, I completely respect that. But as an elected representative, I believe you're there to represent your people. And I think the people have made their voice pretty clear tonight.
Carolina Beach's town council was there. They witnessed the public outcry. The next week, they spoke for their citizens and unanimously voted to oppose seismic blasting. A resolution of the town council of the town of Carolina Beach, North Carolina, is opposed to seismic testing. All right, motion on the table. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We're good to go. Boom. The movement is happening. We're going to stop offshore drilling and move to what does make sense. And there are many other economically productive ways that we can um, work with our coastline. Uh, so many places are heavily dependent on tourism, which employs more people. So if this is about dollars and cents, um, you know, people need to be thinking about protecting the assets they have. Our communities, our oceans, our economies, our future is our choice. Let's not let the wants of the few outweigh the needs of the many. Talk to your elected officials. Stop Atlantic drilling before it starts. Join Oceana and those who have already taken action and visit www.drillspillrepeat.org. Politicians that represent us need to make sure that whatever's going to happen is done in a manner so that the people are protected because that's what their responsibility is to us.